So for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Audrey. Um, I'm a shorebird nerd. <laughs> so today's presentation is in a webinar format. Like I said, we can't see or hear you. Um, if you have questions, um, you can type those into the Q&A feature, which I believe should be on. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so in that uh, menu, there should be a Q&A option where you can type in questions and we'll get to those at the end. If you have something um, pressing while we're going through the presentation, you can type it in the chat and try to resolve that for you. And I'm hoping um, anyone with audio issues is getting that fixed now. <laughs> Um, if I don't get to your question today during the program, you can email me at shorebirds at sccf.org. This presentation is being recorded today and will be available later on our YouTube channel, I believe. Um, we will offer this presentation again in the fall and there'll be more walks. We figure we'll try to make this a regular thing in the spring and fall during migration when there's more birds to be seen around here. So for those guided walks later this week, I will email all of you attending with um, just to confirm who's coming, discuss the logistics, and I'll give you my cell number. So um, to begin with shorebird ID, you don't really want to go with things like color, even though there are birds like the red knot who are named the red knot, they're not actually red all the time. So we use some other things to identify shorebirds. Um, like I said, not color, better methods for this are gonna be their size, their shape, their behavior, their vocalizations, field marks, which are identifying characteristics. And we'll go over some of the most common species observed here and some that are more easily confused with one another. And at the end, I will go over some of the more common seabirds as well, because they are here right now too. Um, shorebirds are solitary well, solitary nesting birds, but they migrate in flocks. And seabirds are birds that um, nest in colonies and eat mainly fish. So things like terns and gulls versus shorebirds, sandpipers and plovers. So today we're gonna go over how to identify the little brown shorebird. Um, right now, they probably all look the same to you, but I'm hoping that by the end of this, some of you will be able to tell some of these guys apart because these may all look the same, but there's actually six different species shown here. Um, this is one of my favorite things, although I have just been told this book is now out of print. So this is the Stokes Beginner Guide to Shorebird. It's a nice little size one you can fit in your pocket. It has these great silhouettes and silhouettes are really great at taking away the things like color that are holding people up with identification. Um, this allows you to look at their size and shape relative to other species. So this one is um, unfortunately apparently out of print right now, so really hard to come by on Amazon, but I did just look it up and there are copies available on eBay and um, some other used book sites. So we'll go over some of our common species here on Sanibel and Captiva, especially during the winter. Um, some of our most common are sandling, sanderlings, ruddy turnstones, willets, and black-bellied plovers. So that photo on the right is one of my favorites, even though it's not really an award-winning photo, it shows some of our more common species here all lined up for size comparison. So in the back, we have the willet is one of the bigger ones we have here all winter. We have a black-bellied plover who I promise does have a black belly <laughs> some parts of the year, um, but right now they're pretty drab looking. We have our standerlings, which are probably the most numerous ones you'll see here and a ruddy turnstone. And the red dot is a little less common, but we actually are having quite a few this year, which is pretty great. So once you kind of learn those main species that you expect to see here, it makes identifying the other ones a little bit easier. So this is what I was talking about earlier, um, what we call field marks. So just unique characteristics to these birds that kind of help distinguish them. So a really good example is the red knot and the short-billed dowager. They are very similar in size and color and shape. Um, the, the biggest giveaway is gonna be the, the long bill, even though it's called a short billed dowager, but actually it has quite a long bill. Um, but so that bottom right is a good photo showing the length of their bill. But there are some other things that help set them apart if they're not being cooperative for identification. So in the top photo, they both have their heads tucked in. Um, that can make it a little tricky, but there's a couple things that help um, set them apart in that example. So the red knot um, has what we call chevron barring on the flanks. So these little triangles along its flanks, that one can be kind of hard to see, but the short-billed dowager also has a black and white striped tail, which helps kind of set it apart. And the really easy one that I find is that supercilium. So it's 
Um, that's just the fancy word for their eyebrow. So in that lower left photo, you can really see the difference of the short bull dowager has a very prominent white eye stripe versus the red knot, which has a, a less prominent one. Another thing besides field marks, size and shape is foraging methods. So how is the bird eating? That behavior will help us um, tell them apart. So the uh, marbled godwit featured on the upper right is one that if you look up a description of them online, they actually joke about how they're not afraid to get their head wet. They're, they're one of the birds that will stick their whole head in the water when they're probing for food. The ones on the left are sandpiper type species where they are constantly rapidly probing for food versus a plover in the bottom right, which is doing that more familiar stop start motion. So plovers are visual foragers. They tend to um, look for their food and stop and um, yeah, carefully pick up their food. Whereas the sandpiper species are just constantly probing and foraging. I hope this video will work, <laughs> see if it works. So this is a semi-palmated plover exhibiting another type of foraging method called um, foot trembling, which may or may not play. <laughs> nope. Cool. Well, last time we did this, it worked. So it doesn't want to play today and I apologize for that, but basically what they're doing, and you'll, you'll see this often on the beach or on the mudflats, they put their front foot out in front of them and they're trembling it, shaking it rapidly. This helps them identify prey items in the sand or in the mud. And, oh wait, maybe it will play. Okay. Well, I'm really sorry about the technical difficulties. When I ran through this earlier, they were working. This is just a video showing all these sanderlings, which are types of sandpipers, constantly moving around foraging rapidly versus the plover who, um, there's a black-bellied plover in the right-hand side of the frame, which does the more familiar stop and start motion of the plover. And I'm really frustrated that this is not gonna play for you. So I'm very sorry about that. So going through the plovers, which um, if anyone knows me are my favorite, I've been working with plovers for the last 16 years. This is a piping plover. So anyone from up north might be familiar with these guys. They nest um, in the northeast, um, the Atlantic coast. They nest in the Great Plains into Canada, and they nest on the Great Lakes where they are actually endangered. They just winter here in Florida. Um, you can see them mostly over at Bunch Beach. We don't get a ton on Sanibel, but from time to time we get one or two. Um, so what I've done here is try to show you some photos of the different ways that they can look while they're here. The top left is in breeding plumage. They have a strong black collar and a black brow, um, orange legs and an orange bill. But the bottom left is their wintering plumage, which is mostly what we see here. Um, so they still have orange legs, but their bill does turn black and they lose that collar and that brow. They're most commonly confused with snowy plovers and semi-palmated plovers. Some people might mix them up with a sanderling, but that's where their behavior is really gonna set them apart. Sanderlings are a type of sandpiper, so normally you're gonna see a large flock of them, whereas a plover tends to be more solitary. You might see one or just a couple. So on the top left is a semi-palmated plover, which is more dark brown than our piping plovers. And on the right-hand side is a piping plover next to a snowy plover. And really the best thing to tell them apart their bills are a little bit different, but the easiest way to tell them apart is going to be that leg color. The snowy plover has gray legs versus the piping plover's orange legs. So then we have our snowy plover, who we love here on Sanibel. They nest here, and this year we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of our snowy plover project. So we have 20 years of data of monitoring these guys. Um, the top left is a typical breeding plumage snowy plover. Um, the middle photo shows a male and a female. So the males tend to be a little bit lighter color and the females tend to be more brown and have less prominent markings. So um, the female in the front, orange black, she's one of our, uh, she's actually our oldest known snowy plover ever on Sanibel. We haven't seen her in a year, but she was at least 14 last time she was seen. So um, the female there you can see doesn't have as strong of a black collar or a black brow. And the lower left is a female in wintering plumage. So no black brow or black collar, but still has those gray legs. Um, they can be a little confusing with some of our other species. So a lot of people mix them up with sanderlings, um, but again, same with the piping plover. A sanderling is a type of 
uh, sandpiper. So you're typically going to see more of them. They're going to be feeding in that constant rapid probing method. Their bill is a lot longer. That's another distinguishing feature between sandpipers and plovers. Their bill is going to be longer relative to the length of their head. Um, so the photo on the left is just show you there is some variation in those snowy plovers. Sometimes they can be a little bit darker brown. Those don't tend to be the birds that um, nest here because the birds that nest here are more camouflaged for our lighter colored sand. So that bird was just wintering here, visiting from somewhere else. But you can see compared to the Wilson's plover, the snowy plover is much smaller and has a smaller bill. Uh, semi palmated plover. Good news about semi palmated plovers. Um, if you can see their range map there on the top right, they have a huge range. And they're actually one of the species that's still doing well despite um, other shorebird populations declining worldwide. They're small, they have a brown back, a orange bill, orange legs, or orange and black bill, excuse me. Um, the bottom photo tends to be what the juveniles and the wintering birds look like. They lose some of that prominent black markings. Um, again, commonly mixed up with the Wilson's plover, but uh, they have orange legs versus the Wilson's plover, kind of pinkish grayish legs, um, and their bill is much smaller. So their whole body size is generally smaller. They can also be confused with snowy plovers, um, but again, same with the piping plover, the thing that's gonna set them apart is those orange legs and that brown back versus the gray coloring of our snowy plovers. So Wilson's plover, these guys nest here on Sanibel and in the area and other ones migrate through. Um, not a lot is known about them. So there are some banding projects going on right now. And FWC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has identified them as a species of concern. So we're trying to learn a little bit more about them. They tend to be a lot more secretive than our other plovers. So on Sanibel, you won't find them unless you go pretty far west um, at Bowman's Beach and keep going towards like Clam Bayou. They tend to be um, away from where the people are. Um, but compared to our other small plovers, they eat things like crabs, so they tend to have a bigger, stronger bill. That photo on the right was taken at Bunch Beach a few years ago, that's a Wilson's plover um, that was kind of herding these fiddler crabs and then ended up eating some. So they need that big, strong bill to break through the crab shells, whereas the other small plovers are mostly eating small invertebrates and insects. So in the winter, they do look a lot like other plovers. This photo on the left, I took on North Captiva, a um, little bit of a plover party happening up there. They were hanging out with a bunch of semi-palmated plovers, but I just put this in here to kind of show when they're, when you see them from the side, you can really see the difference in the Wilson's plovers, big bill and larger size compared to those smaller semi-palmated plovers. There's also some least sandpipers and a sanderling in this photo. Um, but again, the length of the bill versus the length of the head really helps set apart sandpiper species from plovers. So killdeer, I think everybody probably knows a killdeer because no matter where you come from, um, you can see in their range map, they're very widespread. They nest everywhere and anywhere, driveways, rooftops, ball fields, you name it. Um, their Latin name is Charadrius vociferus, meaning loud. <laughs> so they generally, you hear them before you see them. We sometimes get them nesting on the beach here, but generally you're gonna find them in grass fields and um, gravel driveways and things like that. They are a type of plover still, so they do things like plovers do. They, if you get too close to their nest, they're gonna do a very dramatic broken wing display where they feign a broken wing to lure you away. So they're gonna very dramatically flap their wings and peep at you trying to lure you away from their chicks or their eggs. And the black-bellied plover, this is one of our more common species. So these guys are here all winter. Um, people often tell me they've never seen one because they're, they're assuming it should have a black belly. Um, in the rest of the world, they actually call this guy the gray plover, which is probably a better name because that bottom left is what they look like most of the time when they're here. When they get into April and May, when they're ready for migration, we might see them kind of molting into that middle photo where they look a little bit like a Dalmatian. And eventually they will have that full black belly, um, which is the top left photo. Um, the really easy way to tell these guys apart. So they're a plover. So they're gonna feed like a plover. They're gonna run and stop. Um, they tend to be either alone or in very small groups. Um, when they fly, they, um, they have a very high pitched call they give off. And you can see in the photo on the right where they have a black armpit, that's probably the most distinctive field mark. It's really gonna help with these guys. When you see them fly, you're gonna see that 
black armpit. So versus um, the only other thing they really look a lot alike is the golden plover, which I didn't even put a photo of because we don't get them here, but that black armpit will still tell them apart from those guys. So just some photos of black bellied plovers compared to other birds of similar appearance and size. Obviously way bigger than a snowy plover, so no confusion there. And next to a red knot, they are kind of similarly sized, but again, they have a shorter, thicker bill versus any sandpiper species, and they have a bigger, rounder eye. Um, oyster catchers, there's gonna be no confusing this guy with anybody. Um, we only have one species of oyster catcher we expect to see here in Southwest Florida. This is the American oyster catcher. Um, if their obvious appearance doesn't give them away, their behavior will too. They're constantly pulling up shells and prying them open, um, hence their name, oyster catchers. They eat other bivalves, like in that photo, it's eating a sunray Venus clam from Bunch Beach. Um, they do nest in Southwest Florida. We don't have any nesting around here documented, um, but we're about at the very Southern range of where they can be found nesting. So stilts and avocets. Anyone who goes to the Bailey Tract is probably familiar with the black neck stilt. We have had a nesting pair there for quite some time. And I think in the past there was up to four or five pairs nesting there, or so I've heard. Um, they have these really distinctive long pink legs. They're very tall. Um, they're black and white appearance. They really don't look like anybody else around here. They're pretty easy to tell apart. That photo on the left is actually with some stilt sandpipers. Not that they could be confused with them. I was just really excited to catch a stilt next to some stilt sandpipers. So I wanted to share it with you all. American avocets, they winter here. They don't nest here, but we are lucky to have them around in migration and in the winter. The bottom left shows their, um, their breeding appearance has a kind of orangey color. Um, but usually when they're here, they're gonna be more that black and white um, on the right hand side. And again, I have a video that is not going to play, I don't think. Cool. Well, I will try to get that fixed <laughs> for future presentations. So the next group are our sandpipers. So spotted sandpiper, I put first, he really doesn't act like anyone else or look like anyone else. They tend to be solitary. Um, they are spotted during the breeding season and they lose those spots during the winter. They blend in very well with their surroundings, but if you're anywhere with um, a marsh or mangrove, you'll see them kind of bobbing along the edge. And that's their most distinctive feature. They are constantly bobbing their tail. So anytime you see them, they're constantly moving and you generally will only see one or two at a time. So they really don't act like the other sandpipers. Um, they're also the only sandpiper you're probably gonna see perching. So you'll see them on the mangroves or on um, old snags like that photo on the bottom. Um, we have ruddy turnstones. So these guys are one of our more common wintering species. Um, and a lot, like a lot of the other sandpipers, they are Arctic nesting birds. So they make quite a long migration. Um, they also, we do, we do have them here year round. So people think they might nest here because they're here year round, but actually those are just first year birds that aren't migrating. So a lot of those Arctic nesting species to save energy in their first year will not migrate and breed. So we do have small numbers of them during the summer, which can be a little confusing to people. Um, they are a conservation status of least concern, but again, shorebird populations are declining worldwide. So all of our species really are in peril. There's threats to them all across their range. Um, so we're trying to um, you know, offer them a good place to be for the winter and migration here on Sanibel. So they stand out, they have a very sharp pointed bill and they have bright orange legs. And in their breeding plumage, in that top photo, they're very prominent. They, they almost appear like a clown, but their behavior is very distinctive. So they're named turnstone for a reason, um, because of their, their behavior where they turn things over to find food. So they are constantly, although we don't have stones here on Sanibel, you'll often see them flipping over items in the rack line, looking for the bugs and invertebrates underneath or small crustaceans, or you'll see them flipping over shells. So sanderlings, these are definitely one of our most common species here. So anytime you see a bunch of little birds running to and from the waves, those are gonna be sanderlings. They're a type of sandpiper. Um, they 
are here, again, like the ready turnstones, we have some of them that are here year round. So some of those first year birds don't migrate. Um, so we'll have them here year round. And we also have, um, some of these birds are banded, which has led to some really interesting things. So um, we know that we have particular banded birds who return here to Sanibel each winter. And not only do they come back to Sanibel, they seem to have specific territories. So the bird in the bottom photo is T93. I generally see him on North Captiva or up at South Seas. Um, the, the bird in the middle um, has lost some of its band, but we know from the metal number, it's the same bird. It was banded in 2014 up at Chaplin Lake, Saskatchewan, which is a migratory stopover location. And that bird has been here every year since I've been here since 2016 and probably the winter before, but it is always found generally on the east end of the island. And we have another bird, um, I don't think I have a photo of him here, but another banded sanderling that tends to be around Bowman's Beach. So we have these birds, we know they're coming back to the exact same site each year, which is called site fidelity. They're returning to the same sites each year. And not only that, they're, they're, they have a particular territory. So it's really interesting. These birds were banded for different reasons. They were looking at um, the effects of chemical pollution on their stopover locations. Um, which I guess I should clarify, a stopover location is a spot where large flocks of birds are stopping during their migration. So places like the Delaware Bay, um, where all of the red knots and other birds stop to feast on horseshoe crab eggs, um, these guys stop at this Chaplin Lake in Saskatchewan. So they were banding them for that kind of research, but we learned a lot more than just the intended um, information they were looking for. So we're now learning that they are very uh, territorial and return to the same wintering sites each year which is pretty impressive because these birds have one of the widest spread wintering ranges of any bird. So the fact that these little individual birds are coming back to the exact same beaches on Sanibel is pretty impressive. Generally when they're here, um, they look more like that bottom photo where they're very light colored. Their Latin name is Caledris alba and alba meaning white. So they're generally very white colored um, when they're here for the winter. Um, they do get that kind of cinnamon color you can see in the top photo before they migrate. Um, another of our small sandpipers is the Dublin. So they're pretty distinctive. They have a downward drooping bill that's pretty long in comparison to the length of their head. Um, in their breeding plumage, they have a black patch on their belly and they get that cinnamon color back and head. But generally when they're here, um, they look more like that bottom left photo where they're just kind of drab and gray. They're flock birds. We used to see them in large flocks, but like I said, with all the shorebirds, their populations are declining. Um, we're seeing smaller numbers of them and definitely in smaller flock sizes. Um, they're constantly uh, drilling down like a lot of sandpiper species. So you'll constantly see them with their head down probing in the sand or the mud. Probably the easiest thing to mix Dunlin up with um, is gonna be the red knot or the sanderling. So in the photo on the left, um, I asked them to pose nicely for me for a comparison shot, and they did. So we have a sanderling in the front. You can see is much smaller. The red knot, kind of medium size, um, medium to large size. And the dunlin is uh, smaller than the red knot, but bigger than the sanderling, and has that distinctive downward drooping bill. And in the photo on the right, he's with a flock of sanderling, really showing off that bill length versus the head length and red knot. So these guys are very important. So in 2014, they were added to the endangered species list as threatened. They are one of the longest distance migrants. They can migrate up to 9,000 miles each way. So going from Arctic Canada down to the southern tip of South America. They um, typically aren't red when they're here. I did take that photo on the top left here in May one year. So um, sometimes right before they're migrating or birds that are coming up from Central and South America just stopping here will be that bright red color, but generally you're gonna see them looking a lot more like that middle and bottom photo. Red dots are pretty cool. They can actually double their weight before migration. So in that photo on the right, I took last fall, um, wanted to share with you guys, I think it's pretty cool. There was a flock of birds at Bowman's and there was about seven of them here for a week or two. And then all of a sudden they, um, there was about 14. So there was double the size. So you can tell the one on the left is one that had been here. Um, eating for a few weeks and fattening back up for the, the next leg of its migration. And the one on the right had just arrived from migration. You can see how thin it is, but those are two of the same species just showing that size difference during migration. Um, so we have birds that, the bird on the bottom left was actually banded here on Sanibel in 2007. So that is actually one of our wintering birds. 
we have some birds that are still coming back. They were banded here in 07 as adults and they're still here um, this winter, a bunch of them. So they're at least, uh, I guess, at least 15 years old, which is pretty cool and exhibiting that same site fidelity I was talking about where they return to the same beaches. Another really interesting thing about these birds, um, they're kind of prey specialists based on where they are in migration. So when they're at that stopover location in the Delaware Bay, they're gonna be eating primarily um, horseshoe crab eggs, but when they're here in Florida, they eat primarily coquina clams. Um, during the really bad red tide in 2018, a lot of those coquina clams were killed off and there was really no food for these guys. So they were starving, um, which was not great. I was concerned that a lot of them died, but um, by using their, their band numbers, I was able to look them up and see that a lot of them were in fact alive. They were just favoring a site like Fort DeSoto that had more food to offer them for several years. This year, um, they have returned to Sanibel after Fort DeSoto had a really bad red tide last year. So um, just a small sample size, but we can see that they are actively avoiding areas where they had a uh, bad red tide and there was no food for them. Um, they <laughs> are pretty commonly mixed up with a lot of things since they don't stay red. But again, next to the short-billed dowager, um, I know the short-billed dowager doesn't have the best name because their bill is quite long, but Compared to the red knot, um, they have a much longer bill and that more prominent eye stripe, the supercilium. They're much bigger than sanderling, so it's pretty easy to tell them apart from that. But not only are they bigger, they're different colors. So the sanderlings, like I said, tend to be more white overall. That kind of helps. Um, we also have western sandpipers, which you won't see a ton of here on Sanibel. Um, if you go over to Bunch Beach, you will see a ton of them. Um, next to the sanderlings, they do, they do stand out. They are smaller, they're more brown. They have a slightly drooping bill and um, they have more of that cinnamon color definitely before they're getting ready to migrate. So like I said, you'll see a lot more of these if you head over to Bunch Beach or maybe at the refuge on those mud flats. They don't seem to be on the sandy beaches quite as much. They're most commonly confused with semi-palmated sandpipers, which I won't even really talk about in this talk because we don't see a ton of them. We do get a few during migration. Um, it's really easy to tell them apart though because of their bill length. So even though they're similar size, similar color, the bill length is much shorter on those semi-palmated sandpipers. And if you're really hung up on this one, there's some great uh, resources out there. If you just Google Western sandpiper versus semi-palmated sandpiper, there's a lot of folks out there who have put out documents like this um, one on the left here and have blogs about it and show a lot of comparison photos that can be really helpful because this is a tricky one. And the least sandpiper. These we do have here. Um, we do see some on the beach and we have a lot of them over at Munch Beach and in the refuge. They are the smallest shorebird in the world. So they're very, very teeny. As you can see, um, the one on the right I had picked up, we had some sick birds earlier last year. Um, we're not exactly sure what was going on. There was no red tide, but they were sent out for some testing, but that one actually was able to be saved and released, which is great news. But as you can see, they're extremely tiny. So the thing that really sets them apart from the other small sandpipers is gonna be those yellow legs and the size really. So here's one next to a sanderling, which is generally, um, like I said, the most common one out there for sandpipers. So when you see a leaf sandpiper next to a sanderling, it's gonna be much smaller and have those more yellow legs. And, and next to a semi-palmated plover, which is also very tiny, um, they're even smaller. And then we have the short-billed dowager, which like I said, is poorly named, I know, because it has a very long bill. But in fact, there is another dowager called the long-billed dowager. Um, you don't really need to worry about trying to identify those two here. We don't really have any long-billed dowagers. We mostly have the short-billed. Um, the long-billed dowagers tend to be more found on freshwater and interior areas. So this is another Arctic migrant coming down. Um, we do have a bunch around. You're going to see a lot of them over at Bunch Beach. Um, they can be mixed up with willets, which is, again, one of our more common species. Um, but next to the willet, you can see they're a lot smaller and they have longer bill comparative to the head length. That doesn't really help them there. Um, they both have a fairly long bill, but the, the short billed dowager is much smaller. They have yellowish to greenish legs and they're more brown overall versus the willets, which tend to be very gray. And that's the same photo I showed earlier with a red knot where the dowager has striped tail and it's more prominent white eyebrow, supercilium. Um, we also have marbled godwits. 
Um, they don't <laughs> they don't look a lot like anything else around here. So these guys winter here. They nest up north. Um, when I worked in North Dakota, we had quite a lot of them around. In their breeding plumage, they have more barring on the chest and an orange and black bill versus when they're here in Florida, they have kind of a lighter colored chest and um, a pink and black bill, which is very long. And again, they have that distinctive foraging method where they tend to stick their whole head into the water. You can see these guys over at Bunch Beach. We also have a greater yellow legs and a lesser yellow legs. Um, the greater is the bigger one in the photo. They're more common here. You're gonna see these more in freshwater areas or brackish. So you'll see them at the refuge. You'll see them at the Bailey Tract. You'll see them at Bunch Beach too. Um, we don't tend to see them on the beach a lot, on the sandy beaches. Um, they just forage in a different type of habitat. So the best way to tell them apart from the lesser is uh, probably likelihood. You're more likely to see a greater yellow legs here, but also the length of the bill compared to the length of the head is much longer. So that should help. And then we have our willet, which is again, one of the more common ones here. Um, the top photo is showing their breeding plumage, but they do have some barring, um, but they generally tend to look more like that bottom left photo where they're just kind of dra uh, drab and gray. And they're very distinctive because they like to um, give out a loud call. And when they fly away, you can see on that photo on the right, they have very prominent black and white wing barring. So if you're having trouble telling them apart when they're standing, when they're flying, there's really no mixing them up with anyone else. There are Eastern versus Western willets, which are very difficult to tell apart. Um, the Eastern willets actually, I guess, nest in Florida, um, but the, the Western willet is what we have most of the time here. Um, so again, on the top left, compared to a dowager, they're much bigger and more gray compared to those dowagers with the smaller size and the longer bill. Um, next to a marbled godwit. They can look kind of the same if they have their heads tucked in, but you can see that marbled godwit has a more cinnamon color versus the willet being more gray. And the marbled godwit has that very distinctive pink and black bill. So there's really no mixing those two up. Um, they do also look and sound a little bit like a greater yellow legs, but the, the bright yellow legs will always be the giveaway for that guy. So that was most of the shorebird species we have here. Um, I figured I would just go through some of the more common um, larids, so gulls, terns, and skimmers that you might see while you're out there looking at the shorebirds. So this is a pretty typical sight here, a big flock of royal terns. These guys, um, they don't breed until they're three or four years old. So we do tend to have a lot of terns around year round, even though they don't nest here because those younger birds might stay on the wintering grounds for up to three years. So this is our most common the laughing gull. Um, right now, you're gonna start seeing them breed and uh, molt into that breeding plumage over on the left with the black cap. The middle photo is what they usually look like. And the photo on the right is, um, just for anyone who's been lucky enough to see this guy, that is what is called an aberrant laughing gull. He's lacking um, pigment. So um, his legs are hers, I shouldn't assume. <laughs> Their legs are orange and the bill is orange. So that one is here every winter. It tends to hang out around the causeway and on the east end by the lighthouse. But typically you're gonna see them look more like that middle photo. We also have ring-billed gulls here in the winter. This is one of our more common wintering species. There's a lot around right now before they get ready to head north. Um, they're pretty distinctive with their yellow legs and their yellow bill with that black ring around it. So gulls can be pretty complicated with all the different cycles. Um, before they reach maturity, they have three or four different cycles they can go through. So that will be a whole different talk for another day, but just wanted to show you some photos of what they generally look like when they're here. The lesser black bat gull is one of our more common wintering species. Um, we tend to have a lot of them. In the past, there was more herring gulls and less of these guys, but now we have more lesser black bat gulls and fewer herring gulls. And I'm not really sure the reason. I've been trying to ask some other birders what they think. Um, there's some speculation that because herring gulls do really well nesting up on areas around landfills and some of those landfills are being closed up north that maybe they're not doing as well, but I really don't have a solid answer as to why we have more or lesser blackbacks now. They generally as an adult have that blackish uh, kind of slate gray black colored back and the yellow legs. Herring gulls um, are huge. <laughs> So the adults have that light gray back with the pink legs. 
Um, generally, they're going to be able to tell them apart because they're the biggest gull we have out there and they look like, you know, a T-Rex walking among velociraptors out there. They're huge. Um, the bottom left photo is a herring gull next to a lesser blackback gull, just for that size comparison. They look really similar as juveniles, but again, the herring gull is just way bigger. Um, we have great blackback gulls, um, very rarely. Um, I see them out sometimes when I'm on the boat. I have personally not seen one on the beach since I've been here. Um, we also get Bonaparte's gulls, that bottom photo. Um, they are here now, probably, I don't know if there's still any around, but we do get them January, February, a little bit into March. They act more like a tern than most gulls. Um, they're very unique. And they, you can tell them apart because they have pink legs and a black dot on their head. And the one on the right is a Franklin skull, which we also get in the winter very occasionally. Um, they're much smaller than that laughing gull behind it. And they have the really prominent white eye ring. So our turns that you expect to see here, one of our most common is the sandwich turn. Um, they're kind of medium sized. They have a black bill with a yellow tip. Um, we tend to get them by, you'll see flocks of several hundred here. So they're pretty common. The next most common would be the royal turn. So these guys are, um, well, if you've seen our new SCCF logo, we have the royal turn as our logo. So these guys, like I said, they're here year round because the younger birds aren't breeding yet. Um, they uh, tend to be prone to water quality issues, unfortunately. So we have some ongoing research trying to figure out um, why it is they're being affected. So last year we had quite a few die along the causeway um, that were found to have some moderate levels of brevitoxin. And so they're testing the prey items they were eating and testing the birds themselves, trying to figure out what was going on there. Um, black skimmers. So these guys are pretty distinctive. They're known for their um, skimming foraging type. So you'll see them flying low along the water with their jaw open, skimming the water for fish. Um, they don't nest here on Sanibel, but they nest right over at Fort Myers Beach. So we're lucky enough to see these guys pretty regularly. Um, we have foresters turns and common turns. These are some of the smaller turns you'll see. They can be pretty tricky to tell apart, but the foresters turn kind of has that distinctive eye patch, whereas the common turn has a really dark carpal bar and the black on the head, even in the wintering plumage, reaches the mantle, which is the gray back. And just a few of the other turns you might see around here. We have least turns. They'll be arriving next month. They nest here in our area. We have black turns in the fall during migration. They nest up in northern areas um, in like marshes and cattails and stuff like that. Um, we have elegant turns we see very rarely um, on that top right photo. A gull build turn very rarely as well. And a Caspian turn, which you can see in the area. We'll see them over at Bunch Beach. But um, you can see in that photo, it's next, it's next to a royal turn. It's much bigger and it has more black on the face and a much bigger, more reddish colored bill. So that was a lot, I know. <laughs> um, these are some of my favorite books to use for bird guides. Um, and there's a couple apps that are really helpful too. If you can um, you know, get a picture, you can use iNaturalist or Merlin or Google Lens will help you identify something if you're really stuck. Um, so I am sure I probably went too fast or missed some things. So if you guys would like to uh, type some questions into the q and I would be really happy to answer them. Um, the best time of year to see shorebirds in Florida. So um, really anytime, that's kind of the nice thing about Florida is that we have birds here year round. But for shorebirds specifically, if you wanna be here during migration, um, I'd say April and May for the spring and um, September and October for fall migration are really great. Um, so someone's asking where they tend to go at night. Um, that's a good question. They tend to roost. Um, so I, I tend to find them higher up on the beach, kind of in the beach vegetation. Other people have told me they've seen them roosting in the mangroves, which is kind of odd to think of shorebirds perching. Um, but they do tend to hang out in big groups for safety and the ones on the outside kind of act as uh, you know, a sentinel or a guard, they're keeping an eye for predators and they'll switch out those positions so the ones in the middle can rest. Um, but as far as I know, they are hanging out in the vegetation and just not out on the big open beaches. Um, so I have a question about what strength binoculars I recommend. Um, I personally, if I can reach them here, um, I am partial to the eight by 42. Um, these are Vortex, which is a company I really highly recommend because their, their customer service is outstanding. 
And they used um, they own what used to be Eagle Optics. So if you have any of those really old Eagle Optics and you send them in for repair, Vortex will take care of that. Um, so these are eight by 42. Um, some people like the 10 by 42 for the stronger zoom. I find that um, it's too shaky for me because I'm kind of a <laughs> shaky person, I guess. So I just find them difficult to follow motion through. And I like the eight by 42 personally. And most birders I know tend to have the same. Um, how do tidal variations affect shorebird observations at Bunch Beach? Oh, great question. If you're going to go to Bunch Beach, you want to use the Punta Rasa tide chart. Um, that one is the best. So what, if you're trying to cross any of the channels, I would say go an hour before the low tide listed on the Punta Rasa tide chart, and that'll get you out further and you'll get more time before the tide starts rushing back in. The other thing to consider with Bunch Beach, if there's been a strong south wind for a few days, um, even if there's a low tide, the water might still be too high and the flats won't be exposed for the birds to be there. So definitely wanna make sure it's not too windy, not coming from the south and that you're using the um, Punta Rasa tide chart. Hopefully that helps. Um, the tide chart best closer to Bowman's. So I personally, um, if I'm at Bowman's and going west, I actually use the tide chart that says Captiva outside. And I find that one to be the most relevant for that farther west end of the island. Because if you look at the map of Sanibel, the island kind of starts curving to the north there. So the beach is a little bit more north south oriented than the rest of Sanibel. So personally, Captiva outside is more um, helpful to me for that area. Um, like I said, if, if there's something um, you think of later, you want to ask me, just email um, shorebirds at sccf.org. I'll type it into the chat. You can always ask me questions there. So for those of you going to the walks, I look forward to seeing you later this week. And like I said, any questions, just email me anytime.